Hello everyone, my name is Duncan Hardy, I'm a, a product manager in OpenShift and today I'm joined by Aran. Hi everybody, my name is Aran Tamir and I'm the OpenShift Container Storage uh, Product Manager. Excellent, thanks Aran. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about the state of OpenShift Container Storage, but um, while that's going to be your main meal today and you, the meat of our, in our sandwich, I thought I'd start with a nice little moosh bush or maybe an aperitif and just give you all an update on um, OpenShift storage itself. Um, you know, just a quick view of what we're up to, um, the main things that have happened in the product recently and um, where we're going to go to. So I thought I'd start with just a, a quick refresher. I know um, Diane's really good at getting excellent varied audiences here and some of you are very familiar with OpenShift already and some maybe not so much. So let me start by giving you an idea of where we're going with OpenShift storage. Um, there's four themes. These have, have been pretty standard um, through my time with OpenShift storage and we haven't moved from them. I guess what's changed is where we maybe focus, what areas we're, we're, we're playing with particularly. So let me go into each one as you read through the slide itself. Um, the first area is feature expansion. So there's a little thing called the container storage interface that has come to Kubernetes. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in a moment. Um, but that has been um, an area that we have looked at as far as our feature side. Um, we want to make sure and work upstream with the community to make sure that um, we have a complete spec in CSI and enable all the required features that we need. Um, you know, it's pretty comprehensive already, but certain things like resize or clone are or, or still in beta. So we want to take forward and make sure that keeps moving on and meets the expectations of a, an enterprise product like OpenShift. Um, second, um, flexibility. So obviously we wanted you to be able to use your storage flexibly and um, particularly in the, the switchover that's coming from what we'll learn about entry drivers to CSI drivers we want to make sure that we minimize any outages that you experience any lengthy operations that is just a simple clean process so that's another area that we're looking at um, the third theme for today is about enabling choice so OpenShift and it's uh, ecosystem is excellent and we want to continue to do that on the um, storage side. Um, we've got partner certification programs going for um, CSI and we want to continue to grow these options that are available on OpenShift. And of course, you know, what we're here about here to learn about today, we also want to make sure that you have the best experience prop possible and you go straight to using OCS as your storage of choice. And then the final thing on our, on our themes um, it's just around observability. So we've had some time now to kind of look at um, what storage metrics or what storage telemetry you want to pull out of um, your operators. And, and that's an area that is, is a group that we're looking at. How are we aligning with this? Um, you know, if you talked to me three months ago, we'd be very much in the first quadrant, the feature expansion area, um, focusing on doing things there. But that's kind of steadied down now. There are a few key things still to come, but that, that's kind of in, in a good state. So we're now moving into the middle to looking at the flexibility, looking at um, enabling our partners on the infrastructure. So I mentioned CSI, Container Storage Interface. There'll be some of you listening in today that will be able to teach me a lot more about it than I know. And some of you may be a new thing for you. Um, so a quick kind of lesson. Um, what is CSI and why do we do it? Um, if you go back, to um, Kubernetes before CSI, um, you had the idea of um, entry drivers for storage. So those were storage drivers that were part of the Kubernetes core code. Um, they were embedded into there. And um, while there was kind of some um, volume plugin systems, because these things were in tree, and this meant that, you know, vendors wanting to add support for their storage systems or even just fix a bug, they were forced to align with the Kubernetes and hence the OpenShift release. In addition to that, some of the third party storage code that went into that core Kubernetes binaries um, could be problematic. There might be some security issues there or maybe reliability issues. And it was really hard for the maintainers not only just even to maintain, but also test. They might not have access to that storage that they need to. So the storage stakes thought long and hard, and the result was um, CSI. And that's um, essentially a standard for exposing arbitrary block and file storage systems. 
um, into Kubernetes? Well, it, it's a little bit more than just Kubernetes. The CSI goal is to aim for any container orchestration system, but we're here to talk about OpenShift, so let's focus on o Kubernetes today. Um, with CSI, you have a truly extensible um, volume layer now. And the third party storage providers can write their plugins, they can update them when they want. They kind of get out of that being um, part of the Kubernetes release system. And, it, and, and the plus side, you know, just for Kubernetes core is it takes some of that risk out and makes Kubernetes core much more secure and reliable. So what does that specifically need, mean for OpenShift? And um, we've been doing CSI since the 4.2 release, so back in August uh, last year. So it's been around for a while, the API's been in there. And our focus up until now, as I kind of said on the previous slide, has been around enabling partners. So we've been working closely with the OCS team who have their CSI driver already available, and we've been working with our partners to, to educate them and make them available to do that. And we to do, decided to do that rather than move our current entry drivers across um, to CSI because um, the mandatory switch over from CSI uh, over to CSI from entry drivers is still a few releases out, so we had some time to get the base level, the architecture light right, um, and we also kind of wanted to make sure that um, we were able to do this smoothly, so the migration piece before we kind of enforced that. Um, so, what does that mean? Let's have a look at some dynamic provisioning with the CSI driver itself. Um, so, th this diagram is pretty safe explanatory, but let me go through it anyways, just to give you an illustration. So, um, what do you do? What, you've got your CSI driver written, um, you've installed it, everything's good to go. What actually happens behind the scenes? So, your user will create a PVC or pers persistent volume claim on the API server. A thing called the external provisioner will get an event that this PVC had been created. And then what that external provisioner will do is it initiates a create volume call into the CSI driver itself. Then the nice bit happens, the CSI driver talks to the storage backend and the volume's created. And then once that's happened, the CSI driver returns a volume to the external provisioner, who then passes the PV or the persistent volume back up to the API server that's bound and you're all done. And that's how um, you know this new CSI API and the, through the Kubernetes now it allows you to do this plugin and allows you to do dynamic provisioning as it says there. So it's a really nice solution. Um, we've seen some success with it already. <clears throat> so you sold on that. How do you get it from OpenShift or how do you work with a CSI driver in OpenShift? Well, there's three options here. Um, you can go straight upstream and, and you can have a look. There's quite a lot of CSI drivers up there. There's definitely 30 plus last time I looked for various different vendors. You can go and download those uh, just like you would with any other upstream thing and then layer those on top of OpenShift. Um, the only downside there is, you know, this, this is something that you've taken from upstream, so it's between you and the maintainers upstream to look after and maintain and take responsibility for that piece. Um, the nice thing about OpenShift now is that um, we've re-engineered it to be based on operators and um, a discussion on operators itself would take um, of all of Diane's session and she would glare at me and I'm very scared of Diane's glares. So um, safe to say that operators are this fantastic revolutionary move forward for us as far as OpenShift is concerned and we're leveraging them with CSI drivers. So any CSI driver that wants to install um, on OpenShift uh, more officially, then we're um, mandating that they go inside an operator. And there's a great um, operator hub community up there where you can go and do your GitHub request and, and submit your operator in there. And it has great benefits. Um, I always badly describe them as operators are like groupings of containers with operational intelligence built in. So you can do that with your CSI driver and it's a really nice way. And as you can see on this diagram, um, our customers can just search um, for the storage piece and they'll see the CSI drivers and it makes provisioning really easy. There is a third option here and this is to certify your CSI driver and that's a pilot program that we're coming out of currently. Uh, in fact, we've just had um, HPE to be our first um, partner vendor to certify their HP, uh, certify their CSI driver with us. Um, and essentially this just takes the operate a certification that we have today, which does some security checks and, and looks at the images and adds in a simple CSI test that's based on the upstream one that's already available. And we just check that the API is 
working. And what does it mean to get a certified operator? Well, that means Red Hat will fully support it. You know that we've tested it. And um, also it will appear on our, what we sometimes call our embedded, embedded operator hub that you get with OpenShift itself. So I'll stop going on about um, CSI now and move on. Um, OpenShift 4.4, that depending on when you're listening to this, is uh, just around the corner or just come out. And um, what have we done in storage? So you can see on the right-hand side, I think we've got excellent coverage now of all the main storage offerings that we need to have. This has been bolstered massively by um, OCS coming along with their their storage offerings. Again, you're going to hear a lot more about that in a moment. Um, on our side, it's just between the leap between 4.3 and 4.4. We've been looking at bringing snapshot restore and clone to tech preview so you can have a play with that. We also did a sidecar rebase. Um, for those of you not aware, when you're developing a CSI driver, um, there are a whole bunch of sidecars that make some of the more common tasks much easier to do that you can just reuse. So we kind of just rebased the upstream what was there. Um, the CSI test suite that I alluded to is now included um, in 4.4. So if you were developing a driver and you wanted to use it, it's just there and easy to use. And as always with Red Hat, we've continued our focus on upstream work, but the team's certainly done a lot more in this place. Um, and then finally, from my side, and we'll get on to the, the main course, um, what about our roadmap? Um, well, we've talked about 4.4 already, but um, in the medium term, um, CSI, 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 really, to be honest. Um, there's a few things that, that 118 um, move, has moved into GA, so we'll pick those up, resize, cloning, and raw block. Um, we start our own work now on the CSI drivers, so um, the AWS EBS driver, we'll have a tech preview of that, and, and we're going to do ephemeral or inline volumes as a tech preview as well. Um, those of you uh, not, example, uh, not used to ephemeral volumes, um, this is um, for volumes that don't persist after the pod ceases to exist. So um, these are volumes that are useful for storing configuration information or a scratch space for applications. So um, there's a good community upstream about it. Go and have a look at it. And then there's a couple of enhancements that we're going to do. So um, local storage discovery was something that came from the um, OCS team, actually. So that's to look at a, a node and see what storage is available on there. And then recursive permissions, that's around um, making sure that, you know, with things for recursive permission changes for FS Group and SE Linux, it has taken a long time in the past, so we're looking at how we can speed that up. Um, longer term, and, and the further out we go, the more this can change, so, you know, please take this with a grain of salt. Um, we're looking at migration, so that's that clean switchover from Intree to CSI that I talked about. Snapshot restore, everyone's looking for that. Looking for that. Um, you know, we're working upstream with Kubernetes because both in the CSI API and the Kubernetes API objects themselves, they're still both in beta, so we're working to move them forward. More cloud providers, um, ephemeral storage, okay. Um, working more with third-party vendors. And now uh, the good thing is we've, we've kind of had our heads down to try and get CSI going and working in a good state. So that's given us a chance not now to look at more ROFEs. Um, and that's it from the um, OpenShift side. And what I want to do now is hand you over to Iran, who will take you through the OCS pieces. Over to you, Iran. So hi, everybody. Um, as I said before, my name is Aran Tamir. I'm the product manager for OpenShift Container Storage. And I'll try to give you an up-to-date uh, uh, state of uh, OpenShift Container Storage. Um, so just to recap, uh, for those who don't know what is uh, OpenShift Container Storage, um, so the OpenShift Container Storage is another product uh, uh, that Reddit uh, releases. And uh, what we are doing is providing a highly scalable and production-grade persistent storage, uh, which means that we want to be the uh, layer that supports your applications uh, in OpenShift and provide them uh, uh, um, scalable uh, solution uh, and also deploy, uh, sorry, and also uh, provide you a very easy way to uh, deploy it uh, and uh, uh, maintain it. So both onboarding and day-to-day uh, uh, -day maintenance uh, uh, were made very easy with the OpenShift container storage. 
we integrated uh, the product into OpenShift dashboards, and I will show you it uh, in a second. Um, as well, all the benefits of having a, a well uh, integrated product in terms of uh, alignment uh, with the, uh, the releases, the alignment with the, and leveraging uh, features like Duncan just mentioned, uh, uh, features like uh, snapshots cloning and so on. Um, so the, the, what we are looking at, what we were looking at uh, when we uh, designed and uh, developed the OpenShift container storage is that we want to provide the same agnostic level uh, um, that OpenShift is trying to provide for the application and provide it for the data. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, customer can run uh, in any uh, infrastructure that uh, is available for OpenShift. Uh, to ensure that there is no vendor locking, uh, so you have the freedom to choice uh, to choose. Uh, you can uh, uh, start on prem. You can have your dev and uh, uh, test running in uh, uh, various envir environments, either in the cloud or on prem, and then decide where you are actually going to uh, uh, use the uh, production. And again, uh, OpenShift Container Storage provide the same API, the same behavior across these uh, environments. Uh, the second important part is the efficiency. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you get the most efficient storage that you can, uh, give you the flexibility that you're looking for, either with log storage, file storage, or object storage. Um, um, so, and again, it will all work exactly in the same way, regardless of where you're uh, uh, um, working. Um, the third part, which is very important, uh, is the scalability. Um, when, whenever you have a new project, you know where you start, you don't know if it will succeed or not. So you always want to start small and then have the opportunity to scale. And that's also a, a link to the idea of where do I run? So maybe I will start on-prem, I will start very small and then the project is uh, uh, successful, I want to scale, uh, I need more storage for that, I need more uh, uh, um, instances of my application, sorry, instances of my application running. Um, so we support all that, we can let you start small, we can let you, uh, we let you uh, scale uh, uh, in a very optimized way um, from terabytes to petabytes and I will talk about it uh, uh, when I'm, I will talk about the future. Uh, in a high level, uh, the way that we look at it, uh, whenever you have OpenShift uh, and regardless of the environment, we will provide the block storage, the file storage and object service uh, across these uh, environments. Um, so let, let's take, for example, uh, regardless, let, let's take, for example, the AWS. Um, so the object, the OpenShift container storage uh, will actually use the EBS, for example, or any other storage. If it's local drives, we can use that as well. Uh, it's all about cost management and performance that you need. Um, so regardless of what you're using underneath, from the application point of view, it's transparent and you will always get the same experience. Um, so we actually provide the ability to uh, uh, divide uh, between the concerns that the uh, OpenShift cluster manager has and the developer uh, uh, or the DevOps uh, uh, point of view. Same goes for file and object. Uh, regardless of what is your current uh, data layer, either AWS S3 or Azure, uh, from the development point of view, the API is always AWS S3 compatible uh, and it means that regardless of where you're running your application, it will behave the same. You don't need to change your code uh, and you will get the same experience. Um, I talked about simplicity and the uh, ease of use as, as Duncan mentioned, uh, uh, the idea of having the operators and the operators hub uh, 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 really makes everything uh, much easier. Um, you can install OpenShift Container Storage uh, directly from the Operators Hub. Uh, simply click here and it will get installed. 
uh, once you install it, uh, and I'm linking it to the, the integrated behavior that I mentioned before, um, you get all the information that you need from the uh, uh, storage layer directly to OpenShift dashboard. So in this case, you can see that the, the persistent storage dashboard, uh, everything is uh, well integrated. Uh, you can see the status. You don't need to be a storage uh, uh, expert in order to understand what's going on here. It's very easy to understand uh, what application is consuming data, how much data, uh, how frequently uh, 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 specific storage is being used, in what namespace, um, and so on. And, and same goes for the object uh, service as well. As for second day operation, uh, also very easy to scale. Uh, simply decide how, what is the increment that you want to scale with, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's that easy. I want to elaborate a bit about um, the S3 service, uh, which uh, uh, introduced new capability in terms of hybrid and, and, and data management in, in general. Uh, and this service is uh, um, provided by a component we call multi-cloud object gateway. Um, and the idea again is to start lean. Uh, it's a very lightweight pod um, that you have whenever you deploy OCS, you don't need to change anything, you don't need to configure anything. It's, uh, you, you get this service out of the box and you can scale locally by using local storage that you have on-prem or in the cloud. And later on, you can uh, start with uh, mirroring data to, to enjoy uh, uh, better portability for the applications. You can uh, use it for backup and you can use it, uh, uh, of course, for high availability. And, in short, that's the way that it looks like. Uh, on the left side, uh, we have the applications consuming S3 compatible API uh, uh, provided by OpenShift uh, uh, container storage. On the right side, as I mentioned before, for the block and file, we have also here the separation. So the uh, admin can decide where is the actual data. The data can be on-prem, the data can be in cloud native storage, wherever you are working uh, in to save egress cost. Uh, and once you have this configuration, um, you can, of course, change it and add more layers for that, uh, add tiering, add the mirroring between these locations and, and have hybrid buckets, part of the data, all the data is uh, in both, can be placed in both uh, on-prem or the cloud or you can have even uh, multi-cloud buckets that you have all the data uh, across uh, multiple cloud providers. And again, this decision can be made for every bucket uh, uh, that you have. So you can have multiple policies uh, within the same solution and, uh, we, and it means that you have all the flexibility. Um, in short, that's the way that uh, uh, the multi-cloud object gateway provides uh, or digests the data. Um, and it's important to talk about it because it introduces also a security advantage. Uh, whenever an application is writing data, there is a fragment, fragmentation uh, process, deduplication, compression, and encryption. At the end, we have uh, multiple chunks, small chunks, encrypted chunks uh, that are spread across the uh, underlying storage. Uh, whenever we are talking about the cloud, it's another uh, uh, advantage where we keep separately the keys and the data which is encrypted. Um, and that's important uh, um, added value that we bring uh, to such environments. Uh, workload and technologies, that's just to uh, explain how do we look at, uh, at these various uh, services that OpenShift Container Storage provides. So we have the block and in a high level, everything which is transactional databases, uh, messaging, and so on, uh, will go with a persistent volume, which is based on the block uh, uh, offering here. Uh, if we need more than one application uh, uh, consuming the same uh, data set, we'll use the shared file system. Again, from the application point of view, it's a simple PV claim uh, uh, from the OpenShift container storage. Uh, 
but different type of, of that uh, uh, persistent volume claim. Um, the object service um, is mainly uh, um, targeting uh, media, large object in high level, uh, backup, archiving, anything that you, you need when you will start developing usually new application and you want to start with a cloud-like approach or uh, uh, you will probably start using that object service. And again, one of the main advantages is that it's uh, uh, abstracting the underlying uh, storage regardless of the actual uh, environment. Uh, the first two, the uh, services, the persistent volume services provided by Rooksef, and I explain what is it in a second, uh, and the last one provided by the multi-cloud object gateway. Um, and that's the time where we want to explain a bit under the hood, what do we have? Um, so the, the persistent volume storage provided by uh, a Ceph storage, uh, and people usually ask, okay, so I heard about the uh, uh, Ceph storage, I know that it's uh, uh, highly available, there is uh, a lot of features around resiliency and scalability, and it's uh, petabyte scale uh, storage, uh, how different it is uh, in OpenShift container storage. Uh, and the short answer is that it's the same F storage, same capabilities, but a very opinionated deployment, meaning that uh, we wanted to keep it very, very simple for customers. So we took a very opinionated approach and provided um, um, all the benefits in a very uh, accessible and uh, a consumable uh, a way into the OpenShift uh, uh, product. Uh, the way that we did it is we, by using Rook, which is another open source uh, project um, that helps us to, to do exactly that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm taking the Duncan's word about, about uh, what is operator and the fact that it's a bunch of uh, intelligence uh, uh, containers. That's exactly that. That's what the Rook uh, uh, brings to the to the game, and it helps us to uh, magically deploy itself, monitor it correctly, and make sure that uh, we we keep on track in terms of the self filling and other features that we have uh, intact. Uh, the third component is uh, Nuba. Uh, part of uh, Red Hat acquisition happened uh, uh, at the end of uh, 2018. Um, and uh, it's an open source as well. And it provides the abstraction layer for all the data services. Uh, I want to jump to this uh, diagram, not, not specifically to uh, deep dive on what we have here in terms of the components, but mainly look at the, uh, um, the, the the components that we have it on the top. Um, so for those who already played with uh, persistent volume and persistent storage uh, in OpenShift, um, so there is something called volume claim, and the volume claim, as I mentioned before, can be uh, uh, for block and file. Uh, what we also added to uh, to this is something new called object bucket claim. So the idea is very similar to volume claim, uh, but for objects, meaning that uh, by adding uh, several lines to the uh, uh, application YAML, um, the, the developer can easily get um, endpoint access key and secret key to his application and read it dynamically and start using it dynamically, meaning that uh, we, we wrapped all the uh, all the interaction between the application uh, and uh, the object service, and we took the connectivity part and provided it provided it uh, in a dynamic way to the application, uh, and that's the way that it's working. So the application has a bucket claim to uh, the OCS operator. Uh, it creates a new bucket. It creates a new account which is important because you you get an isolation in that way so every application can get uh, its own uh, uh, account and uh, uh, and the data is is uh, dedicated only for this application um, and br and we bring this information back to the application and from that point the application can start writing and reading uh, uh, from the bucket underneath the administrator can decide what type of bucket 
uh, do we use? Do we use the, uh, uh, the default backing store, which is the local storage, or we use uh, something more complex to ensure uh, mirroring and, and so on? Uh, data protection. Um, data protection is one of the most, uh, I think, uh, challenges uh, that uh, uh, we currently see uh, in the market, like any relatively new uh, platform. Uh, uh, we need to tackle all these uh, uh, challenges as well. Um, the way that we uh, divide it is that we see that um, we look at the market and we look at uh, the data protection uh, uh, segment and we uh, want to deliver backup solution, want to deliver MonDR solution and Metro AJDR solution. And uh, let's talk about it for, for two minutes. Uh, when we're talking about backup solution, we're talking about, um, I would say, the most uh, easy way uh, to protect ourselves against logical failures. Uh, users, uh, things that uh, happened due to application uh, uh, bugs, uh, malicious uh, uh, software, and so on. So we want to back up uh, our uh, storage, and we want, in case of a failure, we want to move back in time lose part of the data maybe, but uh, move back in time to a, a normal situation. Um, and we want to uh, base that solution on snapshots. Um, we look at two options. One is local snapshot to our current uh, uh, storage. Another one is snapshot to uh, a remote location. When we are talking about one DR uh, solution, we are talking about multi-cluster at the end of the day. Um, we want to make sure that we can uh, have a solution for disaster recovery uh, across clusters, um, which means that uh, usually we'll put it in separate locations uh, in order to uh, protect ourselves from geographical uh, concerns, uh, flooding, earthquakes, or uh, just power supply failure uh, that takes uh, uh, too long. And of course, have an automatic failover um, to a remote standby or hot site that we uh, keep replicating the data all the time to this location. Um, so that's another solution uh, that we are working on. Um, and the last one is the Metro HA uh, disaster recovery solution, um, which is mainly targeting um, or leveraging, I would say, availability zones. Uh, um, that's something that we already have as part of the um, as part of the uh, our support in availability zones today. Uh, here, we actually want to also support smaller capacity, uh, smaller uh, data centers, and we uh, want to also uh, improve the cost model. So we have uh, new features around that. Just a quick uh, uh, recap on what do we need in order to have this uh, when we are looking at uh, uh, this challenge. So we have data mirroring, and that's what we, we need to support from the, the, the storage point of view. We want to be able to synchronously mirror data uh, uh, across locations, between locations. Uh, we need the snapshot, which is uh, coming uh, uh, soon uh, uh, from uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, of course. Um, we have the backup that uh, is a component that uh, take advantage of the snapshots. Um, and we have the data replication that uh, is, uh, is using a asynchronous uh, uh, replication um, to make sure that we have all the information uh, but in asynchronous way, as opposed to the synchronous uh, uh, data mirroring that I mentioned before. So what do we have next? Um, next, we have multiple areas of, uh, um, I would say, interest that we want to tackle. First one is platforms. Uh, it's a long side effort. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, in addition to uh, our bare metal support, AWS and VMware support. Uh, we can also support OpenStack, Azure, Google, IBM Cloud, Alibaba, Rev, uh, and so on. 
we have a dedicated team in order to make it uh, this delivery faster. Um, we want to uh, improve our security uh, solution for customers. Uh, so currently we have encryption at rest for AWS customers uh, and, and cloud uh, customers uh, in general, but we want to make sure that we can provide it on bare metal and VMware. Uh, and so we want to add encryption at rest and transit, uh, which is unrelated to the underlying uh, infrastructure. Uh, once uh, Kubernetes, uh, oh, sorry, once OpenShift uh, provides a KMS integration, we will also integrate it into the storage to leverage um, and centralized key management systems. Uh, on the multi-cloud object gateway aspect, we want to move to the next phase, which is multi-cluster. As you can see, multi-cluster is <clears throat> a repeating term uh, for the next uh, uh, versions that we have, uh, both in data protection and and in a multi-cloud object gateway. Um, so we want to have a good solution uh, for that as well, for the multi-cloud object gateway. Uh, uh, we are going to introduce a caching mode, uh, mainly for AI ML um, with a huge data set in a centralized location and ability to, to bring uh, uh, closely to the um, digestion area, to the compute area, uh, the, the relevant data. Um, and another step is integration uh, with the uh, multi-cluster uh, uh, dashboards that we have and also improve something that we call namespaces, which is a proxy for multiple uh, um, um, cloud providers. Um, and again, we'll elaborate that on that uh, in the next uh, uh, session. Scalability is another step that we have. We want to introduce uh, independent mode soon. Independent mode means that we have a huge centralized storage which is scalable and serves multiple OpenShift clusters. Uh, it's managed uh, a bit differently. Uh, it is very powerful in terms of all the knobs that you can have, but it allows OpenShift administrator to uh, ignore the challenge of storage management and and provide the data in a simple way, as I mentioned before, uh, for every cluster. So we kind of uh, separating the um, the scale concerns uh, uh, from the OpenShift administration. Um, we also want to improve our uh, efficiency and uh, improve the ratio of uh, amount of PVs per node. Um, and the last one is the data protection that I mentioned before. All these features that I mentioned, we have it in various, uh, uh, um, I would say, progress in our uh, engineering and QA. And um, we hope to uh, del start delivering it in, in the next versions, the sooner the better. Uh, with that, I finished.